Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 5th, 1987. I'm a member of the West Portland Group in Portland, Oregon. Uh, very glad to be here. Thanks for asking me to come. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to get anything out of anything I have to say tonight, but I know that when I do this and I share my experience with the idea of helping somebody, uh, that I get something from it and enlarges my spiritual life. So I'm very grateful for that and grateful for the opportunity to do that. Um, <clears throat> before I get into my story, I also wanted to thank this group uh, the specific group and some of the members of this group. The West Portland group, uh, which is a newer group in Portland, very much like this one, a uh, big speaker meeting, uh, we started several years ago, and it was some of the uh, members of this group that were very instrumental in get, helping us get that group started. So uh, I wanted to extend my thank yous uh, to this group. A um, <clears throat> little of what it used to be like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, I started drinking at a very early age, and... Uh, uh, my drinking career lasted 11 years, and for whatever reason, it progressed at a very rapid pace. Um, just to kind of summarize my drinking, I uh, was arrested 14 different times for alcohol-related uh, arrests, three DUIs. I was in detoxes, a couple treatment centers. I got DTs when I came off of alcohol. I ended up becoming a daily oblivion drinker and um, was a, a chronic bedwetter and uh, and all the other things that go along with uh with uh, the type of drinking that I was doing. And um, I, kind of funny thing, uh, uh, not too long ago I was speaking at a meeting and, and uh, I was thinking about how I was going to s- start off my story and, and I was going to start by summarizing my drinking just like I just did. And before the meeting I was kind of going through that, okay, 14 alcohol-related arrests, three DUIs, uh, you know, driver's license, DTs, and so forth. And then a little voice in my head said, Maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, those, that's that thinking. That's, those are those thoughts. Uh, I, I seem to be far better off if I let those thoughts and, and all the other rapid-fire thoughts that seem to go through my mind just let them go and dismiss them just, just as thoughts. But with all that being said... Uh, that stuff doesn't really make me an alcoholic. Those were just consequences as a result of my drinking. What makes me an alcoholic is that um, all my life I felt different than, apart from, alienated from, and um, was full of anxiety. I had this free-floating anxiety at all times. I had dark depression. And uh, I felt completely inferior to everyone. I, um, and that was coupled with uh, the superiority complex that we hear about so much. And alcohol was the solution to that. Ten drinks made me feel like what I thought you guys, or not you guys, but them out there, what they felt like normally. And, uh, you know, it was that ten drinks that allowed me to participate in life. Uh, without those ten drinks, I was the type of person that, um, you know, if I was walking down the street and uh, there was somebody else coming the other way, if I didn't have the alcohol in my system, I'd cross the street to avoid eye contact with them. Uh, and if I if I did happen to stay on the same side of the sidewalk with them, I would hope I would sit there and go, please don't say hello to me. And I would look at the at the concrete. However, if I had ten drinks in my system, I felt completely comfortable. Um, I uh, you know, and with that being said, I also was the type of person that um, that you know, uh, like down here on this strip here. Um, when I was not drinking, I was a, the type of person that as I'd walk past restaurants or um, hotel lobbies, I, could, I would try to avoid situations like that because I could absolutely hear the people inside of those rooms judging me. And I could have the conversations for them. <laughs> but when I had a certain amount of alcohol in my system, you know, I could go into those places and felt as if I owned the place. Um, my uh, childhood, uh, yeah, I mean, I started drinking at the age of 10. By the time I was, I was a daily drinker from the very start. I mean, I started drinking on a daily basis. I didn't used to tell my story that way. I used to say that uh, I ended up becoming a daily 
drinker, but the reality is, is I became a daily oblivion drinker at the end. The daily drinking in the beginning was, um, was characterized by just capturing that warm buzz, you know, that, uh, that feeling, that sense of relief that I would get by taking what started out as three or four drinks became five or six drinks to seven, eight to ten becoming my magic number. And uh, right off the bat, I was a blackout drinker. And uh, the blackouts progressed right from the beginning uh, where I would go out to, for every ten times I'd go out drinking. Um, you know, I'd have an occasion where once or twice I'd drink to oblivion, blackout, and uh, to where the end it became a, a just an absolute way of living for me. Uh, I ran away from home quite a bit when I was young. Um, you know, I'd get to, I'd be out drinking, get in the car, you know, drive to from Portland to uh, to Idaho or to Eugene or to uh, to different places. Sober up, feel guilty, go home. And uh, and I did that on numerous occasions. I was kicked out of high school uh, six weeks before I graduated for graduated for an alcohol related offense. I was. Um, I went to a, a college prep school in, in Portland, private boys school, and um, I, sh I should tell you that images are a part of my story as well, and uh, I was always trying to be somebody I wasn't, always trying to live to a certain image. It's part of my alcoholism, part of the causes and conditions, and uh, because I was so uncomfortable being who I was. And uh, in high school, I went to this uh, college prep school, and it, the majority of the students that were there were from fairly wealthy families. I was from an upper middle class family at best. And so right there, somebody who already felt different than and apart from, you know, that exaggerated that. And what I did to, um, to compensate for that, the feelings of being different than, was my father had come from a uh, logging background in uh, rural Oregon. And his whole mission in life was to get a college education, get into business so you didn't have to become a logger. So I decided when, I was probably about a junior or so in high school, when other kids were rebelling against their families and rebelling against their upbringings and so forth, they were doing things like getting tattoos and piercings and painting their hair purple and so forth, I decided that I was going to become a logger. And so that was, a, that was an image that I took on at that time. And, um, and so... You know, I would show up at this Catholic uh, private prep school where, you know, the kids were wearing what wealthy kids at private schools would wear, and I'd have my logging boots on, and I'd have my logging cap on, and I just started to create this whole persona. When I got kicked out of that high school, I actually went into the business, and I became a logger. And uh, I went to work and worked for several years as a logger, and... Uh, and those guys were professional drinkers. I drank right along with them. You know, I did, uh, um, uh, by the time I was 18, one of the bosses had called me a lush. Uh, you know, I was getting our crew kicked out of taverns um, for all sorts of, you know, just nutty type stuff that I would do while drinking. And um, this is where, it was about this time that I started a series of trying to control my drinking or to either abstain from alcohol altogether. And I would, uh, the best I ever did on my own was I put 30 days together once. And it was 30 days of just, you know, it was, uh, I wasn't even the boy whistling in the dark. I mean, it was just a miserable 30 days that I grinded out and uh, that came to an end And because I absolutely am somebody that needs that relief. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought that I had two problems. I thought I had an alcohol problem, and I thought I also was crazy. What I didn't realize is that was alcoholism, that, that underlying cause and condition and those feelings that, uh, that I mentioned. Um, I, uh, anyway, I started a series of, uh, you know, and I tried everything. I mean, I tried, I tried different drinking plans. I tried different, you know, a lot of Chapter 3 type stuff. You know, I tried drinking, you know, glasses of water in between drinks, and the only thing that accomplished is, is I wet the bed a few hours earlier in the night than <laughs> when I didn't do it. Um, I tried, uh, I tried, I used to take five by eight cards and I would write out plans of how I was going to drink, you know, and I'd, I'd put down these specifications of, okay, I'm only going to drink if, uh, you know, this circumstances arise and this one, except for on Fridays and Saturdays, I'll allow myself to drink, things like that. One of the ones that stands out in my memory was, um, uh, I was on a bus from Portland down to Ashland, Oregon. Ashland's a little town on the, uh, border of California and Oregon, and, um, between Portland and Eugene, I had come. I had, 
I seem to have kind of a one of the, those light bulb ideas. And they'd come, and they would seem like a really good idea, and they would seem like reality. And I, I could tell you what some of those are in here, and, and you know, we, we would kind of laugh and think that they're ridiculous, but at the time, I thought they were real. And, uh, you know, I've come to find that's uh, some of that insanity that precedes the first drink. But um, on this one occasion, I uh, uh, had put together my plan on a 5 by 8 card, and I was only going to drink on weekends, and I was only going to drink if there's a couple different circumstances arose in my life, I would allow myself to drink during these circumstances. This was on a Wednesday, and the bus had a layover in Eugene. And as a lot of bus depots have, they have a bar or a lounge in the restaurant. I went into the lounge and, you know, and the head started clicking and it's like, well, this plan isn't truly into effect until I'm at my destination. And, you know, and, uh, and I started, I started drinking at the bar and, uh, and I drank at the bar and I remember there was a guy there that was, uh, uh, and he was in really rough shape and he, uh, I mean, he was, he was a, a real low bottom alcoholic and I hadn't quite gotten to that point yet, but, um, I, he he came up next to me and he drank with me for a while and I remember him saying, um, he goes he goes you and I are just alike. He goes you know he goes I'm a business student at the University of Oregon and this and that and so forth. And my initial was like you and I are nothing alike. But uh, as I sat there and the the warm glow of the alcohol alcohol took over, I had the one of those fleeting little thoughts deep down inside me that you know what I am I I am just like this guy. So. Um, I, I tried all sorts of different things to, you know, control and enjoy my drinking. The fall of 1985, I had a conversation with myself, and I had come to the conclusion that there was no lower that I could sink, and that uh, no matter what I did in life, that um, I, I just couldn't get any lower than I was. And I made the decision that I'd been fighting this alcohol for so long, I'd been trying to control it, and so forth, and I just came to uh, to terms with it and accepted the fact that I was a drinker and uh, made the decision that I'm no longer going to fight it. I'm no longer going to try to control it. I'm just going to drink. And whatever happens, happens. And um, three weeks went by, and I drank to oblivion and to blackout uh, every day for those three weeks. And at the end of the three weeks, I thought to myself, you know, God, am I going to be able to make this stop? And that was just, it was, it was, uh, you know, I had a second thought that immediately uh, followed, which said, I don't care, you know, because this is the happiest I've ever been in my life. I'm not fighting alcohol. I'm not, you know, I'm just drinking. I'm not trying to hold back. I'm not trying to put up any sort of image of what, uh, of, uh, you know, of, um, you know, that I'm something other than I am. I'm a drinker, and uh, and I became a drinker. I've heard that alcoholism is the only terminal progressive disease that has a fun phase. And that was my fun phase. <laughs> it lasted about two months. I drank that way for about two months, and then the this, this similar problems that I'd been experiencing in the past started to rise again. Started getting arrested once in a while, started getting things like get, taking beatings and so forth. And, uh, and I started one more time trying to slow it down. And... Um, uh, I, you know, I, I want to tell one. I'm going to sidetrack before I go further with this story. Um, back to the images, um, because images are such a you know such a big part of my story. And when I got into the inventory process and had to look at those character defects and you know why I felt so less than everybody else, and that I have to project these images and become these characters that you know I mean I was like a I, I would whenever I would see David Bowie stuff where he would go from being, you know, the man that sold the earth to the thin white duke to this. I was just like, I'd look at this and go, God, that's me. And I had all these outfits that uh, that went along with it. One of the images I took on, I was living in National Oregon at this time, and um, one of the old ideas that I had formulated somewhere when I was young uh, was that women didn't find me attractive. And it actually was some more along the lines of that I was hideous. And it, it, uh, it came from, it came from somewhere around when I was about 10 years old. My mother used to always talk, oh God, you're so adorable, you're so cute, so this. And her friends would come over and go, oh my God, he's so adorable, so cute. And one day when they were doing that, that light bulb went off inside my head and I thought, I know what they're doing. 
they're, they are trying to compensate for the fact that I'm one of the most disgusting looking human beings <laughs> on the planet. And so they're, they're saying this to try to make me feel better, you know. And, um, and it was right then that that was when I learned uh, that any time anybody gave me a compliment, that what it really was is they could see through. They could see how I felt on the inside. And they would say these things to try to make me feel better because they felt sorry for me. So anyway, um, you know, as I was going to high school I, I, at an all-boys prep school, you know, I didn't have to experience the, the problems of, of, you know, an entire half of the human race, you know, finding me as one of the most hideous individuals on earth. But... Um, Later on, when I was in college, I started dating these women, and I mean, they were beautiful women, and, and I, I put it together uh, after I started dating them for a while, is that, because I raced in my head, I was like, why are these women interested in me? And then it dawned on me, they're from a small town, you know, they don't, they don't know any better. But this, uh, but this one in particular, um, she was involved in the fashion industry, and she started this onslaught of of I got to get into this, uh, got to get into uh, male modeling, into modeling and so forth. And so, you know, with 10 beers under me, I, yeah, okay, maybe that's a career I could do. You know, with zero beers in me, it's like I still have an old idea is that, I, you know, I'm one of the most hideous human beings on earth. Anyway, um, what happened is I, I ended up uh, uh, pursuing the modeling career, doing a couple modeling jobs. I did some runway jobs, some print jobs. I uh, got on with a, a uh, with a reputable and uh, somewhat prestigious agent, and uh, and when they they gave they put the, p the paperwork out and they said you know sign here at the time this was in 1985 they were paying 75 bucks an hour to do this stuff, and um, and you know I walked away and I got what I want I didn't sign the paperwork but I walked away from the agency I got what I want I got, I got that 10 minutes of self esteem that I could sometimes manufacture from other things besides just alcohol. And, uh, you know, after the 10 minutes uh, of self-esteem wore off, I went right back to, you know, having the old idea, even though I try to combat it intellectually. But um, I never signed the paperwork, never did another modeling job. This was in Portland. I moved back down to Ashland uh, in Southern Oregon. And I hung out in the bars there and uh, proceeded to tell everybody that I was a professional male model. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, one particular bar that I hung out at was uh, uh, it was kind of a theater bar, um, and it was a large crowd of, uh, no, it doesn't matter. I got everybody to buy me drinks. Gay men, women, I'm a professional male model, you know, buy me drinks. And I, and I would dress the part, you know, I would dress like what I thought a professional male model would dress like. I wore my hair the way. I went into this whole image, you know, and um, anyway, on one of my last arrests, uh, this is it. the only point to this whole story is the fact that I had images. But um, on my, one of my last uh, one of my last arrests, I uh, had attacked the bartender, and um, and, I, and the police had caught. He'd called the police, and, and police caught me. And, and when I was in the back seat of the car, the and this is in Ashland, it's a small town of about twenty five thousand people. And to give you an idea, by the way, this is like uh, I don't know. I've never been to Pahrumpf. But this would be probably similar to being out in Pahrumpf, you know, strolling around the bar saying you're a professional male model there. But um, uh, I was in the back of this police car, and they, uh, the, the, on the radio, the guy radios in and says, yes, we've apprehended, uh, apprehended Chris Clark. And the guy, you know, the guy on the other end goes, uh, Chris Clark, the professional male model? <laughs> So anyway, um, images were a big part of my story, and uh, was something that I had to, I, you know, I had to get away with. And in, in early sobriety, I was able to to shed those images, and uh, or at least a lot of the images. I and mean, I still struggle with sometimes trying to play a part, but nothing like I used to. Um, fall in 1885, I told you uh, I surrendered to alcohol, and uh, and it was the happiest time of my life for about two months, and then. Um, you know, I started again trying to quit. This time, though, by this time, I have crossed over an invisible line. I've gone from the stages of where I was a daily drinker and would probably drink to uh, 
a Bolivian maybe three or four times a week to a person who did that every day. And uh, every morning I would come to full of guilt, shame, remorse. I had the sweats, the shakes, so forth. And I would swear today was going to be different. And I would go through this whole scenario in my head how I was going to drink differently today or how I was not going to drink at all. And I'd put myself together and somewhere a few hours later I'd be right back to drinking again. And I'd do it all over again. Day in, day out, day in and day out. Uh, that was coming close to my last 12 months of drinking. My last 12 months of drinking, I was arrested nine times for alcohol-related stuff. Um, in June of 1986, this drinking had proceeded up to that point. I was showing such bad signs of uh, DTs, you know, uh, in, in different. I, I'd, I'd been, for several years, I'd been getting auditory hallucinations. I'd be walking down the street after a real bad drunk, and um, I'd get this kind of organ music in my, in my head, and then I'd hear in the, behind me someone go, Chris, you know, and I turn around and nobody would be there, and I'd get, uh, you know, just a different sort of uh, of auditory hallucinations like that. And I, honest to God, thought that everybody, when they had a hangover, had auditory hallucinations. I thought it was just a part of a regular hangover. I had no idea that it was alcohol withdrawal. But um, by June of 1986, I was starting to get uh, some visual hallucinations from uh, when I would come off of alcohol, and the shaking was getting worse, and uh, and the insanity, I was the, the delusion that I was living in was really getting bad. And one night in uh, June of 1986, I went out drinking and uh, came to the next morning, pieced the, uh, the night together, what I could remember back together, and the, I went, oh, God, and I had done something. And it was uh, you know, just one of those pitiful and incomprehensible, demoralizing things. But I was like, i got to get out of this town. i got to quit drinking. i got to get through this alcohol withdrawal somehow. So I decided I was going to wean myself alcohol. Went out on the freeway and hitchhiked up to Portland um, because by this time I didn't, you know, didn't have a driver's license. And I got up to Portland. I, I started with, I don't know, like drinking five or six beers the first night, five or six the second, three of the third night. And um, and then that last night, I think it was either the third or fourth night, I, I believe it was the third night of withdrawing from alcohol, uh, it just got too bad. I mean, I was I got chased by a rodent in my own bed. I had... Uh, um, I was being attacked by swarms of flies. I had, you know, all this stuff. And, I, and you know, the, the funny thing is, is the alcohol withdrawal for me wasn't that bad. It was the fear of it that got me. I mean, the, the, it, it scared me to death. And because of that fear, I checked into a detox. And I went in downtown Portland. I checked into a medical detox. It kept me uh, medicated for five days on Librium. And, uh, you know, I shuffled around this hospital ward and, you know, hospital shoes and so forth. And they, they uh, checked my blood pressure around the clock, giving me Librium. And there was guys coming in there that were, you know, these guys were, I'm in my early 20s. And these guys are, you know, 50, 60 years old. They're seeing snakes coming out of the wall. They're in the detox for two days and kicked out in the general population, which this was attached to a treatment center. Um, and so I knew right away what they were trying to do at this place. They were keeping me extra days in the detox to make me think that I was worse than I really was. And, you know, and, and so, and I had a, I had a doctor who um, gave me a full physical, and the, the doctor took me aside after this physical, and she said, she said, you've got the liver of a, of a 40-year-old man who's been drinking hard for 25 years, and you've got uh, the second degree, I, I don't know how they do this, but second signs or second degree of cirrhosis, and, uh, you're probably not going to live for more than about three or four more years if you keep drinking. Definitely not for 10 years. And I just, I smiled because I knew what she was doing. She was like in the car business where um, you got, you've got the salesman that comes out and, you know, preps you. And then you got the closer that comes in behind that says, sign on this dotted line. And I knew that somehow she was affiliated with this, with this treatment center and was closing me to stay. And I did stay. However, I stayed because my insurance wouldn't cover the, the uh, detox if I didn't. I stayed in there for uh, 35 days. It was a 28-day inpatient deal. Um, I got out. I had no intention of going to Alcoholics Anonymous. I wanted to do this thing on my own. Um, however, I was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous at that time. The meetings, though, that I went to were meetings that um, they weren't primary purpose meetings. They were meetings where things were discussed like... Um, how people's days and how their weeks were. And, um, and I sat, you know, out in, in the audience, and I, I couldn't get it. Then every once in a while you'd get somebody that would saunter up to the podium and talk about not drinking. And then they'd say every answer in the world is in this big book. And I would sit out there and say, 
you know, think, uh, you know, but you don't understand. I don't like who I am when I'm not drinking. When I'm drinking is the only time that I have any sort of relief and actually am the person that I want to be. And um, so, needless to say, I was back to drinking right away. Um, and then, then came more attempts to control and enjoy my drinking, and it led me to uh, some geographics. My, ge my last geographic or my last significant geographic that I did to try to overcome drinking is I moved to Alaska, right outside of Ketchikan, Alaska, um, to Hecata Islands, about an hour and a half float plane right out of, uh, out of Ketchikan, to a dry logging camp. No alcohol, no alcohol allowed, no way to get any except for to get on a plane. Got there, worked for three weeks in this logging camp, and uh, obviously wasn't an alcoholic because uh, I hadn't had a drink for three weeks. And uh, in three weeks, a guy showed up with, uh, these two guys showed up with a bottle of booze, and they said, would you like a drink? And, you know, that equation went through my head. Well, three weeks, I haven't had a drink, da, 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 probably not an alcoholic, okay. And so I took the uh, bottle, and I tipped it up, and I took about three big gulps out of this bottle, and they grabbed it from me, and they said, we've got to make that last. And I had thought we were going to drink the whole bottle. Now, the problem with that is this was at about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night that I had done this. So I had about three straight shots or two or three straight shots of whiskey in me and no booze and no possible way at all to get booze. And the phenomenon of craving come, came on. And it was, man, it would talk about, an, you know, a itch that you just couldn't scratch. I came up hard. I wanted to drink so bad. The next morning, I caught a float plane into Ketchikan with a guy named Dan, who was one of the nicest guys in the world that I worked with. Got into Ketchikan. There's a bar there called the Foxel, which is famous for drinking. It's the kind of bar that, you know, there's a certain percentage chance that you might end up, uh, you know, getting knifed or not making it. Um, when, you order, when you order booze there, if you say Jack Daniels, they don't bring you a glass of Jack Daniels. They bring you the bottle with the glass on top of the bottle and bring it to your table. And, um, and it, was, it was notorious. There was this bar and another bar up there that were just famous for drinking. And so, of course, I went there. Sat down at the bar with this guy, Dan, the nicest guy in the world. He took three drinks, and at three drinks he said, so you think you're pretty badass, don't you? And the night just erupted from there. <laughs> and um, I ended up in jail, and, um, and, and I was, you know, and I'm in and out of a blackout, but I ended up in jail, and, and I took just a... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's just what they do in Ketchikan or if it was something I did, but they beat the hell out of me up there before they threw me in jail. And um, uh, in fact, they beat me so bad that when they threw me in my cell, I was fighting pretty bad. They threw me into a holding cell with two other guys that had been locked in this holding cell for quite a while. And, you know, coming from Portland metro area and going up to Ketchikan, I somehow knew, somehow knew that people that were locked away in Alaska men might mistake me as their girlfriend. So um, when they threw me in, unfortunately, they threw me in naked and then threw my orange jumpsuit in after me. So I did the only thing I could think to do, which was go over to punch the concrete wall, drop to the floor, do 25 push-ups, then put my orange jumpsuit on and lay down because somehow I thought that that would scare everybody away. <laughs> but... <laughs> Anyway, I laid down on this. I laid down on this bed, and um, I tried to stay conscious, and I, and I ended up uh, passing out. And in the morning, the guy that was on the top bunk um, was looking over the, the the thing at me, and I I said, "Yeah, you know." And he said, "Hi, my name's Bill. I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous." And uh, and he goes, "I've got 30 days sober, and um, I'm making him, my sponsor has me in here making amends. I have 10 days of jail time." And I looked at him and I thought, my God, in Ketchikan, Alaska, I can't get away from these people even here. <laughs> but that was the start of a series of coincidences um, that started to happen in my life that, uh, you know, and what was crucial when I get sober here in a few seconds is uh, the fact that I started believing those coincidences. I got on that plane out of Alaska and as that thing took off, and I, never once did I think I had an alcohol problem. When it took off, I thought, I will never come to Alaska again. And um, I went back down to Ashland. I owed eight days of jail time for my third DUI. I did the eight days in jail. I got out. Two days later, I was arrested again. And the Ashland Police Department took me aside, and they said, Mr. Clark, you've got a hell of a drinking problem. You've got to do something about this. I mean, you are, you, you, you're, you're in terrible shape. I mean, you are in bad, bad shape. 
go see this guy, Joe F. in Ashland. Go see this guy, Joe F. He's an expert on alcoholism, and uh, he can probably help you. Okay, whatever, you know, so forth. The next day, they let me go. They, they cited me and let me go. And um, next day, I'm walking down the street, and there's, in Ashland, there's, there, in a lot of towns, there's, uh, there's these sidewalk preachers that are, stand there with a the Bible, and they, and they uh, spout scripture to anybody that happens to be walking by. There was a guy in Ashland, uh, who did this? His name was Monty. I knew him from jail. And um, <laughs> as I was walking by, uh, he read something, and I have no idea what it was, but he read something. And I took a few steps and I thought, God, that kind of sounds, that's similar to what the police said about going and seeing this guy, Joe F. And, you know, and, and I took a couple more steps and I thought, you know, if I was one of these AA people and there was no such things as coincidences, I would act on this and actually go talk to this guy, Joe. I took a few more steps and I thought, what would happen if for once in my life I didn't dismiss this type of stuff as being stupid and actually followed through, even though it feels kind of dumb, just doing it anyway. And so almost out of amusement, I did anyway. I went up to see Joe and um, took him in, in before his secretary let me in his office. All I could think is, please not Alcoholics Anonymous. Please be, you know, aversion therapy, 10 days, couple two-day follow-ups, you know, anything but AA. But when I went in there, sure enough, it was Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, he told me his story and invited me to a meeting that night. And I didn't really want to go to the meeting, but I had a, I felt some sense of obligation to go because I did ask him for help. I went. It was a Thursday night Clay Street meeting in Ashland, Oregon. It's a primary purpose group. Um, they had a habit. It was a speaker discussion meeting. And when there was a newcomer, somebody that raised their hand for their first, second, or third meeting ever, regardless of what the chosen topic or step or whatever they were going to talk about was that night. They threw all that aside, and, they, and instead the speaker would strictly talk about a little what it used to be like, what happened, what it's like now. And then all the participants after that would do the same thing. And I sat in the back of the room. I raised my hand as a newcomer, and, and they proceeded to do this. And for the first time sitting in the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, I started to identify. There was somebody there that drank the way I drank, and they had six months. And there was another person that felt the way I felt, and they had like three years. And so forth. And it went on and on. Little by little, I identified with more and more of these people. And there was this guy that sat right, or stood up right in front of me and he told a story about coming out of the blackout, holding a revolver in his mouth, going back into the blackout, coming to uh, on the uh, floor the next day with the revolver next to him. And um, I had exactly the same thing happen to me, except for I came out of the blackout holding the knife to myself, went back into the blackout, came to the next morning with the knife on the floor. And... Um, and so, you know, that, I mean, he told my story. And he told a piece of my story. I walked away from that Alcoholics Anonymous meeting with a sense of hope. For the first time in my life, I thought maybe there was an answer. Now, and I had so much hope that I didn't drink the, that night or the entire next day, but I didn't keep coming back. And I went out and drank a few more times after that. And one week later, on February 4th, 1987, I went out one more time to try to prove that I could control and enjoy my drinking like a normal person. My plan was that I was going to go out and drink 10 drinks, and I was going to uh, stop, shut it down, and at 11 o'clock, head home so I could get up the next morning and be like a regular person. The guy I was going to go down to the bars with was late. I drank nine beers sitting in my living room waiting for him to come pick me up so he could go to the bars. So, you know, my plan was already, uh, you know, done by the time I went out. Went out that night, did the things I normally did. You know, I had one eye, one eye, one hand over one eye, and so I went to see double. I went from bar to bar, and I ended up getting 86 out of a bar that's almost virtually impossible to get 86 out of. Police were calling me one more time. I was arrested one more time. And then I was really not that big of a deal in compared to a lot of the arrests and so forth that I went through. But the thing is, is that this night um, something clicked, and I hit a bottom. I hit a bottom, and... Um, when I came to the next morning, that feeling of being at a bottom was still there. I was in a place where death was a more attractive alternative than to keep doing what I was doing and living the way I was living. Had I had a crystal ball at that moment, that morning, if I, if I could have looked into it and, and said, if I just keep drinking like this, I'll be dead in a month, I'll be dead in three months or six months, I would have just kept drinking. The thing that terrified me is that I was going to keep living. I was going to continue to live another year, another two years, or another five years like this, and I just couldn't imagine it. 
So I called out to a God that I didn't necessarily even believe in or want to believe in, and I said, please, God, make this stop or kill me. And I checked into Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I resigned myself, and I threw myself into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started doing everything that they told me to do. I was willing to do anything to, to not drink and to continue to go through this. The 90 meetings in 90 days, reading the big book, getting a sponsor, and so forth. And I started, I started down that path. I'm not one of these people that came into Alcoholics Anonymous and loved Alcoholics Anonymous right away. I hated it. I hated the meetings. I hated, I, I sat and watched the clock the entire meeting. Um, I, you know, but little by little that changed. And, 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 um, and it changed as my life changed. I uh, worked the first three steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the time I was about nine months sober, the causes and conditions, those feelings of being different than the anxiety, the depression, all that stuff, the funny thing is, is uh, when I wasn't drinking, those got worse. Physical sobriety didn't solve that, and it made it worse. And day by day, it got worse. I started getting panic attacks. I'd never had a panic attack in my life until I got sober. 44 days sober, I had a panic attack. Um, and I just started getting crazier and crazier and crazier. Uh, to, to give you an idea of how bad I was, um, I took a class, and uh, and it was a psychology class. And the class was about half the size of this meeting. And we took a, a test that was similar to like the MMPI, but it was a stress test. And uh, and it, you self-graded it just to see how you did on, on stress. And I answered this thing, you know, um, honestly. And uh, and at the end, of the teacher said, who scored here between 0 and 25? And, you know, maybe 10% of the class raised their hand and said, you people have literally no stress or, you know, you're, you're Teflon. It just stuff falls off you. Who scored between 25 and 50? And uh, the majority of the class raised their hand. They said, you guys are normal. I mean, you process stress normally. You don't really have any significant events in your life, so forth. Who scored between 50 and 75? About the remaining 15 or 20 percent of the class raised their hand. They said, you guys have some stress in your life. Could be just as simple as like midterms or, you know, something like that. Or you just don't process stress very well. Who scored between 75 and 100? Five brave individuals raised their hand, and he said, uh, he goes, you guys have a significant amount of stress in your life. You are the type of people that, you know, you've probably gone through a divorce, a loss of a loved one, you know, significant geographic change, so forth. Who scored between 100 and 125? Nobody. Who scored, anybody score over 125? Nobody. Now, I scored 146, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, he said, uh, you know, the people that score above 125 typically are institutionalized or locked up in penitentiaries. So after the class, you know, <laughs> this this concerned me. And, um, <laughs> and so after the class, I went down to him. And this professor was in the program. He had three, four years of sobriety at the time. And I went down to him and I said, Doctor, uh, I answered this thing honestly, and I scored 146. And he said, Pfft. he goes, anybody in their first year of sobriety would score above 125, especially if you haven't done your fourth step. Do your fourth step. <laughs> so um, I thought about that for about a month, and... Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and about a month later, I was coming unglued. And I just couldn't take it anymore, you know. And that that advice and suggestion had kind of gone to the wayside. And I called a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I said to him, "I said, God, I'm just coming unglued. I mean, this, I have this free floating anxiety all the time. I have all these weird feelings, and you know, I'm scared of everybody and everything. And I have depression and this." And he said, "Chris, what you have." is something that probably Alcoholics Anonymous cannot address. This probably is not a solution for you. He didn't say it necessarily that way, but essentially he did. And um, he said, you know, what I would suggest is you go see somebody and get on some anti-anxiety and antidepressant type medication. And I hung up that phone, and man, I hit another bottom because I'd been anesthetizing myself all my life and I thought I had an answer. I thought that this, you know, design for living was going to be an answer to my problem. And here a member of Alcoholics Anonymous was telling me to go get on anti-anxiety medications and antidepressants. 
And, uh, you know, I came away from there. This is the second bottom, you know. I didn't know what to do. And then finally I decided, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to take anything for this. I've been doing that. I've been anesthetizing myself with alcohol. What I'm going to do is I am going to do my fourth step. I'm going to do my fifth step. And I'm going to work the steps as they're outlined in the big book, 4 through 12. And if I get to step 12, if I still feel this way, I'm going to kill myself. So <laughs> I, went, uh, I went at it. And uh, I did my fourth step. I did my fifth step. I got together with my sponsor on my fifth step. And, um, we, you know, I shared everything. You know, and, and the important thing is he shared with me his deep, deep, dark secrets first. I mean, that was very important. I mean, that lightened my load right off the bat, you know. I mean, I, I literally thought I was the only person that had ever done some of the things I'd done that was walking around free individual. I shared this thing, and one of the things, um, I shared all the stuff, the resentments, the fears, you know, the sex inventory, the deep, dark secrets, all that stuff. And, um, and I walked away a free person. I mean, I literally, I went into the bathroom the day of my fifth step, uh, and one of the things that I had been accustomed to doing for several years, I'd go to the mirror, and I'd either tear myself down or build myself up. If I built myself up, it would, la be la it would last for like three minutes, and then I'd just sink right back down to know that I was really just a piece of crap. And, um, and it was, this was something I didn't intellectualize. It started in my soul. And I'd do this every time I went to, into a restroom, I'd, I'd go to the mirror. I went after that fifth step to go do this normal ritual that I'd come accustomed to doing. I looked in the mirror, and nothing happened. And I sat there, and I looked, and no, that feelings weren't welling up. And I thought, well, what's going on with me? What is this I'm feeling? And what I realized is, is, that, uh, is that I had some comfort. And it was the first time in my life that I had ever felt comfortable on my own skin without, being, without having a certain amount of alcohol in my system. And that is the way that my reaction to... Life has been since that time. My, the changes that I, took place for me as a result of the five, six, and seven were so significant. That's where I, you know, I believe that AA would help me with my drinking. But I didn't know that the design for living would address the spiritual malady that I had in the first place. And it's a spiritual malady that only a spiritual solution seems to be able to, to address for me anyway. And, um, somebody who, you know, somebody who just absolutely could not function in society without a certain amount of alcohol in their system, I started walking a free man. From there, I, um, you know, I did 8 and 9 because I was so enthusiastic about the program, got into 10, 11, and 12. I started, you know, I started doing all the basic stuff that I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. As a result of all this, uh, all the work and and really making my life about doing the work of Alcoholics Anonymous, making my mission in life to clean away the wreckage of my past and present and to improve my conscious contact with God and to carry the message of alcoholics to others, to not just give that lip service, you know, not give that AA talk and say, oh, yeah, it's got to be a priority, but really doing it, really putting it in my life. My life has just blossomed. I mean, it's... Uh, I still struggle today with things. I still struggle with anxieties at times, but nothing like I did in the past. I mean, I struggle with, um, I still feel apart from sometimes. My home group's similar size to this, and it's easy to sometimes feel apart from when you have this many people. I have to take little actions like go around and shake people's hand and welcome them to the meeting, try to make them feel a part of, try to make other people feel a part of the meeting. By the time I take my seat, I'm the one that, I don't know if I make anybody feel a part of, but when, by the time I take my seat, I feel a part of. And just taking actions, the basic actions of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I was two and a half years sober, I became a stockbroker. Uh, by the time I was five years sober, I got married. I've been married for over 13 years now. My wife is a very active member of Alcoholics Anonymous as well. And we live a, just a, a great life. Uh, when I was uh, about six years sober, I started my own brokerage business. Um, I, myself and a partner, own a brokerage firm. I based the principles of my business on Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, not perfectly, because I'm in a real cutthroat business, and I've, ended up, I've, I've done some things I've had to go back and, uh, and clean up. But the basic principles of Alcoholics Anonymous were how I built my business. I'd have competitors of mine look at me and say, that doesn't make business sense, what you're doing. And it doesn't, but it makes good spiritual sense. And it seems that when I go to that place and I put my spiritual life as a priority, it's, it's almost as if God, you know, 
takes care of me. You know, that God would, uh, you know, God will do for me what I couldn't do for myself. And, um, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, I keep coming back because I still suffer from alcoholism and uh, because the gifts of, I, I couldn't have dreamed, you know, like I said in the beginning, I'm somebody that couldn't walk down the street, you know, without alcohol in my system. If you were on the sidewalk, I'd cross the street to avoid having to have eye contact with you. And, you know, here I am standing in front of uh, a bunch of you tonight talking, and, um, you know, I'm okay, and I'm okay as a result of this. Big Book talks about being rocketed in the fourth dimension, and uh, uh, one of my mentors in the program talks about how much of that fourth dimension do you want? How much do you want to really settle for? And, man, I want it all. I mean, because I'm a completely different person than the, the person that walked in here. You know, I am. I physically look different. I'm, you know, I am, uh, uh, the way I process, the way I think, the way I perceive is a complete change in the way I was when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm, I am so, so grateful for that. Um, I'm just going to close with what uh, Chuck Chamberlain used to close with or closed at times with, and that is, uh, you know, what I really have come to is I have two choices, and that is I can either live a uh, self-centered life and suffer the consequences or I can live a God-centered life and suffer the consequences. Thanks for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.